I think I'm going to get used to, I'll get all my steps and stairs in for the, the day over the next couple of days. So, um, Soji, thank you very much for that. And uh, the video, I think, really kind of sets the scene for really what we're all here and the scale of the challenge, but also the scale of the opportunities that are available. Um, so thank you for that. Um, just a, a couple of words that obviously the agenda for the couple of days those sessions are all laid out. Uh, you, there are some paper copies of the agenda, I think, uh, and also via the HOVA app that uh, you should all have received the instructions for. That will uh, reflect any kind of latest changes um, and so on. So do keep an eye on the app if you can for any kind of up-to-date uh, changes that we need to make you aware of. Uh, just to keep things interesting and to keep everyone on their toes, uh, tomorrow, there will be sessions taking place in another room, in the Grand Ballroom, which uh, those of you who've been here for the GPC conference uh, will, will know is just around the corner. Um, and alongside that, there will be sessions taking place in here. There will be a marketplace uh, session, which I think is a very exciting initiative, which allows people, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, to come together to be able to present and pitch ideas. I think that's really uh, an exciting endeavor and really kind of underscores the the nature of what people are here to do, which is to find active solutions to the challenges that we face. Um, so do have a look at the uh, agenda for a flavor of the sessions. The sessions will, will consist of uh, a moderator plus guests uh, and the the panelists will, will all be presenting uh, as well and of course there'll be plenty of room and space for q a um, so it'd be good to keep the sessions as interactive and as lively as possible because there's a lot to there's a lot to discuss so i think it's good to have a, a free flow of ideas so once again, welcome to everybody and, and special welcome to those watching online too. And uh, let me then hand over the floor to my colleague, Oyun Sanjusuran. She's the Director of the Division of, of External Affairs, uh, who will be moderating the session on enabling a green investment environment. Uh, Oyun, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Good morning, everyone. And of course, there are many, many people online as well. So good day and good afternoon, good evening. First of all, I would like to invite our distinguished speakers to the floor first, and then I'll introduce you. So we have two distinguished speakers. Please uh, come. Yeah, anywhere is fine. I'll be, I'll be sitting here, Helena, and you can just take up the floors. Okay, Amalia, so if I just press this, I'll get my slides. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much. So um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to moderate the first session of the private sector conference. And it, the theme of the session is enabling green investment environment. And you've heard executive director Yannick Limarek now mentioning that this is one of our four, what we call pillars or prongs of the transformative approach of the Green Climate Fund. And as I mentioned, there can be hundreds, if not thousands of various policies, policy tools, instruments that will be really, really key for private sector to attract them and entice them to invest in climate action. Um, we all know that the scale and timing for the climate action is really key, but in order to get the scale and timing, of course, without private sector, it will be impossible to tackle the climate crisis no one, no country, no government, no business can do it alone because we're talking about shifting trillions of dollars of investment. And then we need to work together in a very innovative way. I would like to introduce our panelists and we're very happy to have um, government representatives, but also international organization representative. First of all, um, Minister of State of Belize, Honorable Christopher Coe, 
who is the Minister of State and Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Investment of Belize. Minister Koe, please wave. <laughs> Thank you. And he has experience on climate finance with an emphasis on the energy transition. We have also State Secretary of Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation of the Argentine Republic, Honorable Cecilia Nicolini. Good morning. Um, she's a political scientist with a lot of um, also background in um, not only political science, but also um, she's been research at the MIT recently um, as an official of the national government, recently in her role as advisor to the president and executive coordinator of the Economic and Social Council. Cecilia Nicolini worked on the frontline government efforts to deal with the COVID pandemic on acquisition of vaccines, for example. And of course, she's been championing the sustainable de development and innovation agen agenda in Argentina. We're also very pleased to have Deputy Minister of Finance of the Republic of Ghana, Honorable John Ampuntua Kuma. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, Honorable Kuma is current member of parliament uh, by background, he's a lawyer and an entrepreneur with over 15 years of experience, including as a first chief executive officer for the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. Um, he also has a doctorate in business innovation from the business school in Switzerland. And um, Ms. Helena McLeod, and we're all very familiar with the Global Green Growth Institute here in Korea because uh, it's an international intergovernmental organization. And then we closely work, GCF with GGGI have been working as a deliver, delivery and implementing partner. Helena is a deputy director general and head of the Green Growth Planning and Implementation uh, at GGGI. And then uh, in this role, she leads 30 plus country offices spread throughout different regions of the globe. And Helena has over 25 years of experience designing leading innovative development programs and multidisciplinary teams in the areas of green cities, renewable energy, sustainable transport, climate smart agriculture, forest preservation, climate resilience, and regional economic integration. So we have a very rich background and very different but very uh, valuable angles to be presented. Um, the, we hope to hear specific actions that respective country governments and organizations have been undertaking in order to introduce enabling environment for private sector, especially for green and also blue, Belize mentioned economy. So um, without further ado, I would like to invite first uh, our minister from Belize. And maybe I'll just, I was supposed to go through those three, four slides while I'm speaking, which I forgot, but these are our speakers. Thank you so much. Minister, go ahead. thank you. Oh, yeah. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to share insights from Belize and its recent efforts and experience in mobilizing climate finance in private markets. Since our independence almost 41 years ago, Belize has burnished its image as a leader in conservation. In those four decades, we have co-designed processes with community actors, NGOs, and industry to develop policies, a legislative framework, and domestic funds to support a nationwide network of protected areas. We also developed our ecotourism product and secured innovative ex external finance arrangements to further our conservation efforts through one of the first debt for nature swaps as far back as 2001. Thanks to these early efforts and vision, our natural capital, both marine and terrestrial, has largely remained intact but it is under significant stress. Population growth, national development needs, 
and global challenges like climate change have placed cumulative pressures on the very resources that underpin our economy and sustain the livelihoods of our people. These pressures, however, have only highlighted the need to re-envision Belize's natural capital as a lever to progress our countries and our people's resilience and development. We have therefore taken even more aggressive efforts to sustainably manage our natural resources because simply put, we have no choice. Our most recent attempts include adopting a suite of measures to buttress efforts to protect the Western Hemisphere's largest living barrier reef and a World Heritage Site, taking the first step in our region to adopt an offshore oil moratorium for our terrestrial waters and successfully concluding the largest blue bond to date. The costs of undertaking these measures while facing continuous ex exogenous natural and economic shocks and ongoing aftershocks have led to high indebtedness. In numbers, average annual losses of 4% of GDP due to climate events severely stunt our development path while at the same time materially contribute to distress level public sector debt stock of as high as 133% of debt to GDP in 2020. These shocks and resultant high debt limit our fiscal space and slow our efforts to improve the lives and opportunities of our people. Our commitment to transform our economy toward a low emissions climate resilient development pathway is steadfast. With our limited resources, Belize has introduced public sector reforms, prioritized climate resilient infrastructure development, undertaken on ambitious targets to further reduce our already negligible emissions and put in place effective adaptive measures. We are diversifying our productive sectors, promoting climate smart approaches and strengthening the blue economy. We're upgrading digital infrastructure and reimagining education for the future. Scaled up investments in health and social protection systems and improved crisis response and preparedness. And most importantly for us, we're embarking upon a path of energy transformation to energy independence and security through the utilization of our renewable energy resources. Belize's, Belize recognizes, however, that to go beyond and to achieve better for our people, we must address our debt situation. Debt restructuring is fundamental to improve fiscal space and importantly to facilitate investment in sustainable development and resilience building at scale. To this end, the government undertook an extensive debt restructuring exercise for its external commercial debt. Through the recently concluded blue bond debt for marine conservation swap, Belize's debt to GDP ratio was reduced by 25% in 2021. In addition, we are fully committed to continue our efforts on fiscal consolidation. As part of this, Belize has adjusted its approach of securing financial resources for public sector investment by restricting non-concessionary financing and focusing more heavily on grant and concessionary financing to support its public investment and financing needs. Our debt to GDP now stands below 90% and over 40% reduction in less than two years. Belize's debt restructuring would likely not have been doable due to the high commercial rates we are saddled with by leveraging our globally recognized commitment to responsible environmental stewardship, as well as a long-standing relationship with partners, we unlocked new non-traditional sources of private finance and reoriented debt servicing to natural capital investment. Each partner to the Blue Bond had specific roles that were crucial to success. The Nature Conservancy, a world-renowned conservation partner through its affiliate NatureVest, acted as arranger of the Blue bond loan transaction. 
the U.S. Development Finance Corporation provided key credit enhancements in the form of political risk insurance on the blue loan, thereby effectively converting the debt instrument from Belize risk to U.S. government risk. This in turn meant that the blue bonds would become investment grade. Credit Suisse fully financed the TNC subsidiary to make the blue loan and thereafter successfully marketed the ESG link blue bonds, which was multiple times oversubscribed with institutional investors globally. And of course, Belize. Belize not only committed to achieve marine conservation targets and to use a portion of the financing savings to fund conservation over 20 years, but maintain the political will and fiscal discipline to follow through with difficult fiscal consolidation measures as part of its homegrown economic recovery and transformation plan. The blue bond is just the start of the Belize case. We are working domestically and with bilateral and multilateral partners to leverage its success and to identify further opportunities to bridge the financing gap of over $1.6 billion equivalent to over 70% of our GDP that is needed to implement our updated NDCs. With a focus on the future and recognizing the private sector's role in supporting resilience building and economic transformation, in the past year alone, together with key conservation partners with a view to combine public and private capital, Belize has embarked upon the world's first marine and coastal project finance for permanence initiative to ensure the resilience of key marine and coastal ecosystems with supporting, while supporting the well-being of our citizens. We have passed a modern Securities Industry Act. We have put in place a public-private partnership policy to mobilize private sector capital that supports large-scale investment in infrastructure and further other development projects that align with government's policy priorities for public benefit. And we have approved a national investment policy and strategy to establish a national framework that will guide and provide the enabling environment for both domestic and foreign investments. While these added measures, or with these added measures, we hope to attract and spur green and blue investment in our economy with the ultimate objective of fostering our sustainable development ambitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Very enticing, but also very interesting to hear about the um, debt swaps for marine conservation. Of course, we very much look forward also to hear more about the energy transition and other policy instruments as well. I would like to invite now um, Argentina, State Secretary, um, to come to the floor. Cecilia Nicolini, State Secretary for Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Mm, this is a great opportunity for us to be here. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I think we have to get ready to unlock capital for climate action. So it's great to be on stage with the GCF that we are working a lot together um, with Jenny, with Henry. We are young yesterday also with the GGGI, our new friends that we are working together in order to implement all the, the funds and the financing that we need to work towards this transition. And I will take these 10 minutes as an opportunity to share what we are doing from Argentina for our climate change policy and believe that it is a real opportunity for investment and for and to do a real uh, transformation. Uh, do you have the... Yes, um, perfect. So I think that I was going to make an introduction, but we all agree on the diagnosis of what we are going through in this triple planetary crisis. And my colleague from Belize, he put it quite well. And we share a lot of the vulnerabilities that we, he was uh, showing. As you all know, Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean is the most unequal region in the world. And although our emissions are quite low, for example, Argentina accounts for 0.7% of global emission, still, the impact of the climate crisis hits 
really profound in our territory and affecting mostly the more vulnerable people. So we really need to work on that place. So what we are working from Argentina, I will go straight then to the projects, uh, but a little bit of, of what we are doing in our governance structure, which this is very important because climate change is not anymore a goal, a government goal. It became a state policy. And I think this is one of the most important things whenever we can, we need to create and enable uh, this um, economy for, for green funding. Uh, we have the National Climate Change Cabinet, which is a place that I, I, I'm leading, uh, but coordinates the response and the articulation of policies, plans, and, and programs for all the ministries. But not only that, but as you can see in this, in this slide, we also have the participation of the private sector, of the scientists, of universities, of unions, which this is very important. Whenever we are talking about how we can transition in a just way, we need to talk about creating jobs. I think that has to be part of the discussion. And obviously integrating also the vision and participation of indigenous people, of local people, of women, um, and as well as political parties. If we want our policy to go beyond our government, beyond our political cycle, we need also to involve uh, all the political parties at large, including, of course, the opposition. And what we have uh, developed so far, and I'm very pleased to be here today because last week we submitted our draft for our mit National Mitigation Adaptation Plan for 2030, which has been a real uh, work for coordination. I remember my times dealing with the pandemic at the front line of, of the presidency of our country. And it was really indeed, to, we had to do a, a real coordination uh, throughout the countries and with other countries. Well, climate change, it's a little bit similar because we need local answers, but with a global perspective, because we are all involved in this, uh, in this, in this endeavor. So we uh, presented the, the draft for the plan, the 30, 2030 plan that we will present officially uh, during the COP in Egypt. And uh, Besides that, I, I think one of the things that we hope more our countries from Latin America and the Caribbean and the African countries as well, is that finally the COP will talk about means of implementation and we were able to take the adaptation agenda and the funding and the, and the, and the um, damages and losses agenda to the next level that, that we really need. So, uh, as I said, this, I will go uh, straight to what we are presenting in the COP and what we have here and what we can share with you now a little bit with in detail. But in a nutshell, the strategy of our plan, you can see the strategic lines, which we decided not to divide it into the classical sector, right? Because we believe that we need all the ministries and the sectors involved in each one of the strategic lines. Of course, the energy transition plan if was if it's one of the most important one, not only because involving our economy and our opportunity for development and needs, but also in the in the uh, global circumstance that we are now for uh, energy security. Uh, sustainable mobility, of course, is something important for Argentina. Argentina is part of the lithium triangle, which has one of the biggest reserves of lithium, which will play a key role in the sustainable uh, mobility plans and electromobility and, and so on. Um, of course, something really important from a country for, like Argentina, sustainable management of agri agro systems and forest. Um, augmenting the productivity of our, of our uh, agriculture, but doing it in a smarter way, doing it more sustainable, uh, leading also with the challenges we have. For instance, the methane emissions that we have from our livestock, how we can manage with that, and at the same time work toward food security, not only for the country, but for the region and for the world. And in that sense, creating plans and innovative ways so of sequestering the methane, of uh, integrating the livestock management with forestry and many other plans that we are working together with, also with the private sectors and with the local producer. Biodiversity and common good for conservation, of course, as you know, Argentina and many Latin American countries and the Caribbean 
uh, we have uh, really important uh, ecosystem services to provide not only to our countries but to the world so we have to make an effort in preserving that and this is not only a task that we have to do it from our countries but we also need to have a, a global agreement and cooperation to do to do that as as belize was explaining with the with the great project that they are working on production transitions sustainable and resilient territories territories about uh, uh housing and sustainable cities and and many and many other uh, programs one thing that was key and is very important for us are the instrumental guidelines in order to move from the design of a plan into the implementation which i believe this is something very important for you all that are sitting here what are the plans, what are the measures, what are the projects that we could uh, help you uh, invest to advance this agenda? Uh, I will go a little bit further in the next slide uh, for what we, what we um, say about economy for transition. But at the same time, we're working on capacity building. This is something very important for the countries as well. Prepare the people to make that transition, include a local perspective on the projects. We were talking about that yesterday with the GGGI, how we can own the project, the perspective, the team where we cooperate and we work with funds, with, with multilaterals, with international organization or the private, the private sector. Of course, research, development and innovation is key. Like it was during the pandemic with climate change, our decision as, as public policies has to be science-based. We need to use data. We need to uh, make the most out of the the technological advance that our our society and in our case our country has uh, and a key sector as well is action for climate empowerment we all know by now that not only the youth but they are championing this discussion and they are pushing our governments globally to make more and to really commit to the climate change agenda so they need to have a special place in the design and the and the implementation of this plan and an interesting perspective also that we are the cross-cutting approaches gender and diversity is one of our priorities yesterday we were discussing this with mr ban ki moon uh, he also champions not only um, uh, environment and climate change but but gender and as we know women are, are the most uh, vulnerable sector in the world and uh, climate change hits especially to to women um, risk management, health, and of course, as I said before, just transition, we need to create jobs or to transform the existing one into more sustainable jobs. All this plan, as I mentioned at the beginning, also something very, very important is that we have over 200 measures to boost climate action. Uh, they are very, very specific uh, measures that we are working now on transforming these measures into specific projects. So we can really enable and unlock this capital to make the profound transformation. Thinking that this is a great, great opportunity, not only for us as a country to make a real transformation and transition in a more sustainable economy with inclusion, but also as a way of making um, making um, a interesting investment and 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 being part of this transformation. Um, this is obviously aligned with our international commitments, our NDC, which is very important. We have to have internal uh, ali um, alienation, but uh, be aligned, but also with our international uh, commitments. And something that we are still working on, I'm sure this slide, because I believe it's important to give you specifics and some facts, but we are still working on it. So it's not, they are not the final numbers, but we are fine tuning them. But approximately, we will need around $150 billion in order to fulfill our NDC by 2030. And in, in that amount, if we break them in, in the measures that I mentioned and go into specific projects, you can see uh, some examples that we are uh, undertaking and we are also uh, putting costs into, the, into these things because we believe it's not only important to know or analyze the cost to fulfill our NDC, but we now know that it's gonna be more costly our inaction if we don't, do not do anything to make these uh, transformations and this transition. This is just in a nutshell, a little bit of the breakdown of our implementation cost divided into the six uh, strategic lines. 
uh, and uh, with this, uh, we are in each one of the lines. We are working with the ministry, with the private sector, uh, with, with the private sector, uh, with experts, and obviously with the GCF and many other uh, MGVs to uh, really work on the specific project that can take this plan into into real action, into implementation. So this uh, information will be hopefully fully updated and finalized, and I will be able to share with all of you, not only by, by COP in Egypt, but also in different uh, opportunities that we can have to, to talk about this. So the three main tools that I would like to just share in the last few minutes that we need to advance this project and we are working on, we created a sustainable uh, uh, finance table uh, that is sitting in, in the Ministry of Finance, but it has the participation, of course, with the Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, of Public Works, they are national banks, uh, they are other entities, uh, the local uh, stock uh, exchange as well, to create all these tools such as green bond, dev swaps, new instruments, dealing with all these uh, alternatives that we have to uh, channel uh, this um, um, uh, investment for the, this project. Another thing that we are doing is uh, with the National Budget Office, is the labeling of our national budget uh, with a climate change perspective just to see how well or how bad we are doing in uh, to re in regards of our uh, national budget and how we are investing and how we can make improvement in, in many sectors. We did this uh, with a gender perspective uh, last year and we are sharing this methodology with many other countries and it was very, very successful. Uh, so now we are working to do this at the national level, but also at the subnational level. And I think also it will give us a lot of information of what we are doing and how to uh, make some change to make this uh, even better. And as I mentioned uh, before, and this is something that we are discussing also with the GCF, GGGI, and many other organizations, is how we can turn all these measures that we identify in order to uh, uh, fulfill our NDC into concrete projects involving the private sectors and different government areas, uh, which will give us a, a real path uh, into our to fulfill our, our, our goals. And this is, well, the five main needs, I think we all repeated during the last two or three days, if you have attended a conference from the public sector. Um, I think Janik was very clear also this morning that we need more funding, we need to create uh, more robust funds, we need the countries that have committed and they, uh, they haven't really channeled the funds that they promised more than 10 years ago now. Um, for for uh, developing countries to deal with this transition, we really now need the adequate flow of funds for, for climate action. Um, adaptation is something that we are working together from the region, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and I believe well, Africa as well, as I mentioned, in Egypt would be a, a key area to work with um, and a special funding for adaptation. Something that there's room for improvement also, I have to say GCF, it's uh, speeding up agility in the process. Sometimes we are sunk in heavy bureaucracy and, uh, and time consuming that surpasses the political cycle. And sometimes that affects the incentives that public official may have into really putting this into work. So how we can create more, be more agile, how we can, be more data-driven, um, be more agile in this, and of course, work together with local teams that we, we, we will be able to, to manage this. Uh, well, back in National Human Resources, I'm always a champion of creating local capacity. Really, I believe that is very important and will bring more agility to this project and technology transfer. And this is something I learned a lot dealing with the pandemic and dealing with the vaccine acquisition. And I think it was really clear when we experienced the pandemic. And I thought that, well, we all thought we were going to, uh, to uh, come out better after the pandemic, but apparently we didn't, uh, didn't do that good. 
you can remember at the beginning, um, China shared with the world the genome sequencing of the COVID-19, and that enabled countries and, and companies and labs and pharmaceuticals to uh, design, produce, um, design and produce, not distribute, design and produce vaccines that were safe um, and that uh, were uh, efficient to deal with the pandemic in less than a year which was a record, this kind of vaccines, it takes between 10 and 20 years to be developed. But as it always happened and how, what it happens with funds for climate change, the problem is the redistribution, is how to, uh, how to redistribute uh, all, in that case, the vaccines to all the country. And while rich countries were able to pre-purchase even up to nine doses per inhabitant, there were countries, and there are still countries, that they couldn't afford even one single dose for the medical personnel. So I think that we need to really discuss uh, the international finance architecture and the way we collaborate, we cooperate, because if solidarity is not the base for all this, uh, uh, all the, the climate action, I think we are not going to move forward that much. So besides, uh, there's, there are a lot of challenges. There are great challenges. I, I really do believe uh, that we have even uh, greater opportunities to work together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, State Secretary Nicolini. And uh, I was very encouraged to hear about the multi-stakeholder platform approach getting all the stakeholders and then creating the National Climate Change Cabinet. And uh, of course, we know that innovation is key, but innovation in governance, innovation in institutions, and also um, innovation and transformational planning, which we could see from your presentation. So uh, thank you so much. And then uh, now I would like to invite, and of course, um, just to let you know also our participants online, that there will be time left for question and answers, please. If you have any questions and answers, feel free to send those or Huwa. I think that's the right way to pronounce, right? Scott, Huwa application. <laughs> so um, now I would like to invite uh, Honorable Minister from Ghana, Deputy Minister of Finance, John Ampuntua Kuma. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bring you greetings from Ghana. In Africa. The circumstances of the last three years, from COVID to Ukraine war, has shown that we are critically interdependent. It doesn't matter where you are located on the part of the globe. And the relationship has shown that we have to work together to achieve a better world. We have seen in 2021, according to the uh, research by Center of Epistemology of Diseases and Emergency Event Database, about 431 disastrous events occurred in 2021, which were as a result of extreme climate change. And it affected over 100 million people, uh, resulted in over 10,000 deaths, and cost the world about $252 billion in economic losses. The recent IPPC report reiterated the need for accelerated climate action if we are to reverse the impact which has manifested in both land and ocean temperatures. Ghana has just assumed the presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. It's also known as the V20. And we will continue to play a key role in the fight against climate change. Ghana's transitioning to a low carbon economy is critical for two reasons. It is how we ensure that we arrest global warming and restore balance whilst building resilience within our economy and society to fiscally withstand the effect of climate change impact. And uh, my president, the president of Ghana has just handed over as the co-chair of the sustainable development goals. And as part of our action to strengthen uh, the, the fight or to promote global uh, green action, we believe that it is very important for governments across the world 
to work with the MSMEs or the micro, small and medium scale enterprises, especially in the private sector. In Ghana, they employ about 80% of the workforce and they generate about 70% of our GDP. And so our continuous engagement with the private sector is very key in the fight for climate change action. Government sees climate change as a developmental issue, explaining why the National Development Framework titled Agenda for Jobs, Creating Prosperity and Equal Opportunity for All, highlights key policy interventions to combat climate change in the medium term. As a, as a signatory to the Paris Agreement, Ghana is implementing its climate change action through the revised Ghana's nationally determined contributions. The revised GHNDCs would need between nine to 15 billion US dollars in investment to implement the 47 nationally determined contributions programs from 2021 to 2030. To demonstrate government's commitment to green financing in 2021, a sustainable financing framework was developed to screen programs and projects with green or social credentials that to be funded through the national budget. These programs and projects that will form the basis for issuance of our green bonds, social or sustainability financing transactions to refinance new or existing expenditures that have been identified in accordance with this sustainability financing framework. Due to the unfavorable market rate and the downgrade of our, uh, Ghana's uh, credit rating, uh, Ghana is waiting for good opportunity to issue its first international green bond as has been issued by other countries. The country is looking forward to establish a domestic green bond market and we want to tap into the expertise and resources of the GCF. The carbon markets of Ghana to uh, government of Ghana and Switzerland have signed a bilateral agreement which says the framework conditions for implementation of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is the voluntary cooperation. This is to pilot the climate change mitigation activities under Article 6 2 on the internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. Five projects we have the solar PV, landfill, gas stove, biogas, pellet, in Ghana will be developed into mitigation activities to achieve the bilateral agreement. Ghana is expected to receive about $100 million from Switzerland in exchange for carbon credits to meet its climate commitments. Government again has also signed letters of intent with Sweden and Singapore to exchange carbon credits for financing bilateral negotiations with the true countries which we have begun. Then our engagement with the private sector on climate finance, the government of Ghana has over the past years engaged the private sector to mobilize green investment and promote green private sector development and harness skills and knowledge for addressing climate change in developing countries. And we've taken a number of initiatives, one of the policy uh, interventions that we are rolling out currently is called the Environmental Fiscal Policy, under which we want to establish the Ghana Green Bond. And the idea is to uh, fund it through domestic revenues and provide incentives to the private sector. We also have an act on e-waste to prevent dumping of electronic waste into our country. And then we also have the National Plastic Management Policy all of these interventions are to help protect the environment. We have just recently introduced a program with the banking sector. It's called the Sustainable Banking, uh, Sustainable Banking Principles for Commercial Banks to prioritize loans that focus on greener activities and projects. And it is being led by the Bank of Ghana and Ministry of Finance. All these interventions are tools by government to promote greener action in our country. The private sector climate change investment fora had been organized to, pro to provide opportunity for private sector players to develop and submit funding proposals to the GCF. 
through government engagements, a commercial bank called EcoBank has been accredited as a direct access entity to the GCF. EcoBank has also submitted its first funding proposal, Accelerated Solar Action Program, which is expected to be approved by GCF soon. Additional entities such as the Ghana Investment and Infrastructure Fund, the GIF, and the Agricultural Development Banks are being supported to be accredited by GCF to help leverage additional climate financing to implement climate actions in Ghana. So the GCF should speed up in, uh, in the various approval for funding proposals that have been submitted to the fund, such as the Accelerated Solar Action Project, the Resilience Landscape Project, the Greater Accra Climate Resilient and Integrated Development Project to ensure the country meets the intended climate uh, results. Ghana also has aims to mobilize carbon finance at scale from the international carbon markets and use domestic carbon pricing policies, among others, to achieve the ambitions of the NDCs in the long term. We should therefore need the support of the GCF to build more capacity for our nation in this direction. Finally, uh, it is my hope that our collective efforts and determination will help achieve a better preserved world for the future generation. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. And um, as you all heard, the, um, the examples of green bonds screening the financial system, but also um, the bilateral exchange uh, with some of the um, countries like Switzerland, Sweden, and Singapore uh, on joint crediting mechanisms, which I think is, will be very interesting and innovative. And uh, we'll see how Article 6 will work on the ground in reality. And then very happy to hear about also potential carbon pricing policies. And of course, for GCF Green Climate Fund, as you probably know, we try to balance the investment and then sort of deliberately, conscientiously also focus on investing in adaptation. So um, we're mandated to invest at least 50% into adaptation. Um, and then out of the investment in adaptation, it's also focused on vulnerable countries, Africa, SIDS, and um, the LDCs. And that's two thirds of our investment in adaptation is going to uh, those countries as well. And we're very much also looking forward to working with Ghana, not only on funding proposals, but also um, on enabling environment, which as mentioned this morning by executive director through our tool of readiness, project preparedness facility, which will help not only with capacity building, but also planning with adaptation, including adaptation planning and also project preparation study, uh, project preparation um, tools as well. Thank you very much. I would like to now ask Helena McLeod to um, bring the angle, the perspective of green, Global Green Growth Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, it is fantastic to be here. Um, everybody in this room and online has the potential to change the course of history. We all have the opportunity to save the planet for ourselves, but also for our children and future generations. The question is, what are we going to do? And what are we going to personally do? It absolutely has to be a collective effort. But in terms of action, that's where GGGI focuses. So we have about 45 members globally, and we have about 35 country offices that span Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Europe, and the Pacific. And we work in a really particular way. We try and embed ourselves, literally sit within our partner governments. And the reason we do that is because firstly, it's a partnership, but it's also really about knowledge transfer and again, about leveraging action. The second thing we do is we try and link that policy to the implementation. 
So we support about 30 of our members with their NDCs, their NDC enhancements, their long-term load development emission scenarios and green recovery strategies. And then we try and put it into action with them with a really big emphasis on leveraging in private sector finance behind the climate challenges. Yes, we also look at public sector finance, but let's face it, if we're going to address this challenge, we have to harness the private sector. So we do a lot of work in terms of developing bankable projects, so pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies, but we also work on that regulatory framework to enable the private sector to be able to invest. So for instance, in Guyana, we help with the energy re regulations to enable independent power produce producers to sell onto the grid. So whatever the constraint, that's where we come in. But I'm gonna look at a couple of examples. Um, firstly, something that we call national financing vehicles, N. FVs. And there's a whole list of different countries and different financing vehicles that we've helped establish with our partner governments. And these have very strong private sector components. I'm going to highlight a couple. One is the Mongolia Green Finance Corporation. That's a, a funded initially by Readiness. Um, we supported a, the direct access entity that took that PPP forward. We supported the legal structuring with GCF money, readiness money, and then the accredited entity linked it to the project preparation funding. And that has now been set up as a legal entity and it includes loan equity and um, grant components with the aim of filling that climate, climate financing gap at the local level in Mongolia. So that's one example. Another example, which is in the pipeline, also linked to GCF readiness, is the Thailand Circular Economy Finance Facility. And I find this one really exciting. So I was in Thailand recently and I went, I love to go on site and I actually love waste in the sense I love to go and see how we deal with our waste. Obviously, one of the biggest challenges globally, but also a massive emitter of methane in particular. So what we've done there is we've actually had a call for proposals um, to the private sector, inviting a private sector company to come and work with us and pilot a new type of technology, which makes refuse derived fuel. So it's literally fuel from waste. And this refuse derived fuel has the energy component of 60% of coal, and then that's used in local cement manufacturing. So it's a win-win. What's amazing is, is this dump site, which is literally a mountain of waste, within a couple of years is going to be a flat field because all of that waste is going to be used in a constructive way. Now, the innovative part that we come in on, working with Readiness Finance and one of the leading commercial banks in Thailand, is to actually expand that to what we hope will be about 200 waste sites, all the major waste sites in Thailand, using an innovative financing model. The other thing why it's so important is because the private sector doesn't really like funding new technologies. And a lot of what we're doing in the climate sphere is about new technologies because we, we haven't really had to solve this to the scale before. So this is a demonstration project that then will be able to scale once the commercial sector knows the benefits of actually financing it. Now, we've had a number of um, mentions about the, the green bonds. I'm going to give another example. I do think the global bond market is a massive opportunity for climate change. Now, I wrote down the amount of the total bond market globally, that's bonds, not green bonds, is almost 130 trillion US dollars. About 1% of that is currently green. What an opportunity. If we even converted 3% of that to green, we would be able to really, in a major way, contribute to, to filling that climate finance gap. Now, we've had a, a very nice success story last year. We supported Peru on their green bond issuance. So it was a sovereign bond. It was for about 3.2 billion US. And we also supported a one 
billion uh, euro denominated social bond. And these set a number of records. So this was the world's largest sovereign sustainability bond ever, the largest ever sustainability bond from the Latin American region, and the first euro denominated bond from Latin America as well. So it set a number of, of firsts and it's created so much interest. We're now scaling that work to about 10 countries across Latin America and Asia. Um, Africa, we're trying to work, but it's still a very early market for green bonds. Um, but we're partnering with Luxembourg and the Luxembourg Stock Exchange to really scale this green bond work up. And it's so exciting. It also is about jobs. So that green bond is likely to enable over 70,000 green jobs. Um, the statistic there, 1.5 million people below the poverty line will be supported. And of course, you've got all those climate benefits in the renew renewable energy sector. But we've also done bond work in Indonesia that supports peatland restoration and forest restoration and forest preservation. So the bonds have enormous opportunity. We're now working with Ecuador on a blue bond as well. So these are really tangible opportunities but it's very much about how you ensure the money goes to the, the place you want it to get to. So we also support in that post issuance, ensuring that the results really do transpire. Now, the second area that I thought was worthy of mentioning is again from Latin America, and that's um, the environmental and social and governance screening tools and the, the whole taxonomy work around greening um, the banking sector and the financial sector. Of course, that's where the Trinians sit. So that's where we need to also provide support. We work with both um, central banks, public banks, development banks, commercial banks. And in this case, we work with the regulator. Um, and we set up with the regulator a website portal where all of the financial sector institutions in the sector could load their status in terms of ESG. So essentially it was a list of questions that they filled in and that enabled the regulator to see where actually is the financial sector? How much have they already done? What more do they, do they need to do? And that's enabled the regulator to actually start setting targets for the whole sector in Mexico with the aim of accelerating that whole sector reform. Again, incredibly exciting. And in terms of the green taxonomy, these are the different um, aspects of ESG that we support. Now, I'll bring it back to the Green Climate Fund. We, we work with many different funders around the world and many different countries, but I do feel that the, the GCF does play a critical role. Um, and what we're trying to do with the, uh, the readiness funding that we get is use the examples which have actually been from, from different funders um, and take the best practice and incorporate that into the readiness support that we give to our countries. So this is one example of how we're really trying to include that innovative finance into a suite of readiness proposals. Um, so these countries, we've scaled the, the Peru experience and other experience to a St. Lucia, Dominica Republic, Nicaragua, Ecuador. And, and Peru. So building on that and accelerating it. Um, now these are programs now starting or we hope will soon be um, approved by the GCF, totaling about 6.2 million. But in terms of how much can actually be mobilized in terms of climate finance, you can see that leverage ratio is really high. We're talking multiple billions. Now, in terms of our own pipeline of, a, of green finance, we have a pipeline of about 9 billion US. Um, it's not enough. So what we're doing is looking at how we can scale that even further with new innovations in the financial sector. Um, yes, we're looking at the debt for climate swaps. We're working with a number of countries on that. Sustainable banking round tables, different types of PPP. The opportunities are there. The partnerships are there. We just need to take that action. So thank you for just being here and being here with your passion and for people online, their passion as well. I really believe we can solve the challenge that we're faced with if we work together in an innovative way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena. So um, 
congratulations, first of all, to GGGI for all the concrete examples that you've mentioned about the new financing vehicles in Mongolia and Thailand, but also thematic bonds, the um, green bonds in Peru, ESG screening tool, green taxonomy, but also the recent example of how readiness, maybe just a few millions, can leverage potentially investment in billions as well. And that's that's the idea in attracting, of course, private sector as well. So um, I'm afraid we started a bit late with the opening. So I'll just allow maybe, um, I'll, I'll just have a look at the WUVA application. And then um, just give me a second. Right. So um, there's a question. And then um, maybe because we have only a few minutes left, I'll just ask one question and then maybe I'll just ask whoever would like to respond, but also we may take the last few, um, uh, one minute or less. So it's from Ekanath Kativada. What are the strategies to support small scale enterprises? Um, who are also greatly promoting climate smart technologies. So of course, you know, the enabling environment, transformational planning and policies are very, very important. How, but how small scale enterprises can actually benefit. Thank you. Thank you. So we do a lot of work on the, the small scale micro. We have a whole flagship global program on, um, we call them greenpreneurs. Um, so, so individuals, entrepreneurs that have different types of um, sustainability business, um, and we support in different ways. So it can be grant focused, it can, can be loans. Um, but there's also potentially a GCF funded, um, very large sort of second level um, incubation program with the Korea Development Bank that the GCF is currently considering. Um, and that, again, is looking at the incubation side, providing equity and debt, um, but business support services as well. So we recognize, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of Africa, but throughout the world, that the, the SME sector is going to be absolutely fund fundamental in this shift. But there's a lot that we can do, and I, I think the GCF can play a fundamental role as well. Thank you, Helena. Any of our speakers on small and medium-sized enterprises? But also, um, the floor is open for the questions for here as well. Yes. Yeah, sure. So one of um, our perspectives in the in the national cabinet as well, and the work we do is not only at the national level, at the ministerial level, but also is working with the 24 jurisdictions. Argentina is divided in 24 jurisdictions or regions. And it's very important uh, to work together with them because the country is very diverse, uh, socially, environmentally, and economically. So they are a lot of perspective that we have to work with the, the local people. And that includes when we talk about creating jobs, um, uh, be producing better in a smarter way. It includes involving the small and medium companies that represents more than 90% of the companies in, in our, in Argentina, but mostly in all the regions. So it is very important to work with them. And together, for instance, we do a lot of work with that, with national banks. So so we can provide them with loans. So all the items that you see from the strategic lines can be also aligned with their own policies. If we think about energy efficient policies for this company, we have to provide them not only the technical perspectives, the policy framework, but also the funding in order to be able to do that transition in a sustainable way. Minister Coe. Yes, um, as far as MSMEs are concerned, um, in Belize, we're already small. Almost all of our businesses are, are categorized as MSMEs. Um, our focus has been on that in terms of this administration. Um, we've actually just approved our an MSME um, policy and, and we, I believe at its essence, and this is not necessarily about climate finance, but at its essence, it's for micro enterprises in particular, it's about the ease and cost of doing business. How do we enhance that? And how do we enhance access to finance? Uh, and, and when we look at, at those components, um, part of the effort is, is in terms of simplifying. Um, I think there's, I can't remember his last name, but Geronimo uh, Frigieri. Um, um, and wrote a, a, a book on simply keeping it simple 
Um, and in effect, that's what we are, we are putting into action as far as enabling micro enterprises access to finance and, and doing business. Before uh, Deputy Minister, maybe there is a question from the, from the floor. Or Scott is waving that I should be finishing, but if there are no questions from the floor, maybe Deputy Minister, maybe you can just uh, so, comment, you. Just not to... only on MSMEs, but any. Else before we Thank finish. you. I, I spoke about the important role of the MSMEs and the, the critical uh, interventions that government can do is to give them incentives and support. Uh, and I talked about the sustainable banking arrangement where we are encouraging commercial banks to prioritize um, private sector, including the MSMEs that are seeking loans to do greener uh, businesses. So if you can demonstrate that your business activity can promote green in the environment, you, you, you get to benefit from some of these facilities. So a lot of uh, policy interventions, either through subsidies or incentives or taxes or loans, especially arranged loans, are being given to the MSMEs to promote uh, green climate. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, very rich discussion, huge spectrum of, I think, concrete policies, importance of enabling environment is very key. And then uh, being a former also politician back at home, I know that it can be actually very complex. It's not very simple, but this is such a key for also for private sector to invest. So I will uh, finish with urging, of course, governments to do more and more on this enabling environment, but also private sector, please, if you have any barriers any solutions that you want to ask government, please go to the government uh, because um, it may not be that straightforward for the government to come up with all those complex solutions, right? So don't just wait, go and speak. And then as Argentinian State Secretary said, the, multi in, 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 the inclusion of everyone is very important, right? Thank you so much. And thank you our distinguished speakers as well. <laughs>